In this video, I want to have a look at the Methodist churches, particularly in North America. There's a small handful in here um, from Europe. Um, but most of my work zones in North America just because there's so much. Um, I think it helps just to narrow it down. Uh, also, in North America, we're dealing with a shorter historical timeline than uh, places like Europe, where uh, a lot of these old buildings um, can easily be attributed to um, time, uh, since they have uh, centuries in their historical narrative um, of development of this type, whereas North America has the whole Columbus narrative and the 500-year-old narrative, basically, um, and then the founding of the New World. Um, and if you follow the work of people like Michelle Gibson, who has sort of dove into the circuit board earth and the frying of the circuit board and the um, devastation that occurred as a result and then the resetting basically of uh, of what was previously a uh, worldwide civilization. Um, so then you have uh, movements such as uh, colonialism, uh, you have the, the movement of the Catholic Church, um, and the horrors that go along with all of that. Um, going right down into the mud flood narrative, um, and the orphan trains and the insane asylums and all these things, the world wars. Right, so you have this whole string of resetting going on, and uh, that's what a lot of my research um, zones in on, focuses in on um, this uh, effort to reset what was there previously and then put a new label on it. So this video, like I said, is going to focus on um, the Methodist churches, um, particularly in North America. So let's look at um, some of the roots of the Methodist church and some of the people involved. So Methodism, or the Methodist movement, began in the 1700s. Um, and we have a, a group of three individuals um, particularly responsible for it. We have uh, a John Wesley, his brother Charles, and a George Whitfield. A little bit of a backstory on them. Um, educated uh, at Oxford. Um, established what they called a holy club, which I thought was interesting. Uh, let's take a look at some of those characters from the holy club. We'll just go through a couple. Uh, this is Charles young Charles and you'll notice here the same pose all the time right and we've seen similarities before this is supposed to be Charles and John Wesley of course uh, establishing their church a um, bit of a curious tale going on here it has a bit of a Columbus feel here it's like uh, reseeding the religion of the people this would be Whitfield, the uh, third of that group of three. Again, notice the hand. This was a major influence. Uh, ja Jacobus Arminius, a major influence uh, to get the, uh, the Methodist movement off the ground. And then we have a handful here of uh, other members of the, the Holy Club. John Clayton, this is. This guy looks like he's licking his chops. John gambled. And back to John Wesley. A couple more of John Wesley before we get back to the buildings. There he is at a later date. Oh, one more member of the Holy Club. And we have a statue of John Wesley which is found in the Westminster uh, Central Hall. So, um, revered, a revered figure, to be sure, in the historical, official historical narrative. And there really is no shortage of uh, churches of any denomination, really, in North America. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I split it up into the different types of, um, of denominations. Um, one thing about churches, um, for those of us that look into the uh, alternative historical narrative, let's say, 
uh, or those of us that are trying to peel away the uh, existing deception. Um, a lot of people will, will pawn off churches as, um, while, while they might question how some of the uh, larger buildings, government buildings were put together, the churches sometimes seem to be believable for people. Uh, the church having, I think, almost a bit of a spell on our psyche that uh, they're, there's less doubt as far as the construction dates and historical timeline for people. And some of them go way back in towns that were being developed, particularly in the 1890s, according to our narrative. Um, many of the churches were in existence in the 1860s. So there, there's even an allowance for that in the historical narrative. I think maybe the uh, the thinking there could be uh, that it was this was the first priority of people was their uh, was their religion and they had no problem erecting these structures to worship. Of course, I do propose a, an alternative timeline to that. That's why I bring you a lot of these visuals. Uh, to maybe you you ponder on it as well and and come to the realization that um, the story is far-fetched in the least and it's worth another look. I particularly like these ones with the texture on the stone. Give a real sense of age. And you'll see of course the uh, cymatic type windows. Anyone that's looked into this research will understand that uh, we're dealing with uh, old buildings that were used as some sort of energy device uh, as part of a grid and a lot of what we call antiquitech on the tops and the organs and the cymatic style windows are all interwoven into whatever society existed before the new world came about. suspecting we're looking at bell towers without bells here. It is interesting too with the early narrative uh, of the establishing of these denominations we have actually a series of what they're calling Great Awakenings. Uh, there's a first great awakening it looks like it occurred in the time that these gentlemen lived mid 1700s uh, and then we have a second great awakening now this second great awakening coinciding with the explosion of society in the 1800s now they give um, a timeline of the late 1700s 1776 to about 1850 uh, a, a massive explosion in the Methodist Church. Um, they say here, 1776 Methodists made up two and a half percent of the population in the states, and then by 1850, um, Methodists made up 34.2 percent of their religious adherents, which then became the uh, majority at the time. So that's quite an increase. That's quite a uh, quite a growth um, in uh, membership. This one uh, deserves a special mention as well. The uh, First Methodist in Chicago, uh, curious building, uh, unique, uh, otherworldly feels as well. Definitely worth its own video. But this Great Awakening. Uh, they attribute to um, the method that they used. They had what was known as a circuit riders, or circuit riders, um, ministers that uh, rode around and uh, spread word um, in outdoor settings. And then they attribute uh, the Second Great Awakening to the mobility, I suppose, of their method. 
And uh, there actually was a third Great Awakening as well, occurring between 1850 and 1900. Um, so, interesting to, uh, you know, look into the historical timeline and, timeline and see how it all sort of grows um, at the same pace we see everything else growing in society with the dramatic population boom and the uh, advent of uh, the Industrial Revolution and what came about as a result. There's certainly no shortage of these uh, structures. Uh, that's why I'm kind of breezing through them as quickly as I can. There's Whitfield again. Must have heart problems. Holding his chest all the time. They all seem to be. And these are everywhere. I mean, everywhere. So I think it's worth um, looking into the churches of your area, especially if they're looking uh, old and castly and have a bit of a, a decoration, or if there's a pipe organ, that's a real indication that, that it's worth a, a second look. Um, and then we should allow ourselves to consider that these were um, inherited uh, rather than a part of the linear uh, timeline that we've been uh, um, indoctrinated with. And when we cu couple that in with all the other uh, types of things that uh, I've looked at previously on this channel, uh, we're looking at, we've looked at canals, bridges, um, post offices, hotels, government buildings, uh, all having this, uh, well really it begins with a doubt, a doubt creeps in on uh, on really how capable were these people at, in, during this time period of building in this manner. I, I think I was mentioning how we allow ourselves or allow the churches to have this capability while we don't allow others to. Um, like there's an assumption that churches have a an unlimited supply of money uh, or ability or some a closer connection to God or something like that. I don't know exactly what it is, but it's uh like 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 this. Let's have a look at this. this is in Ithaca, New York, and yeah, I don't know. Methodists say eh? they loved they loved their. Uh, denomination so much that they built castles with pipe organs so uh, you know I propose if, you, if you're familiar with my videos I propose that when we see this look we see these arched doorways and um, the castle features that we're looking at um, remnants of a past civilization and then also the churches survive better over time because of that allowance we make um, where so many of these other buildings have been demolished um, or um, destroyed in a war or destroyed in a fire or destroyed in an earthquake um, for some reason a lot of the churches seem to um, slip through the cracks and make the cut it's in Nebraska this one um, and I think that's why, because of that allowance. So in that way, we have these preserved in our communities. Not all of these. A lot of these don't exist anymore. This is in Minneapolis. Like, take a look at this. Really? I guess it's a cross, but it's a little more than a cross, isn't it? And then you, if you're familiar with this research, you'll see these little knobs on nodes and understand that that's part of the uh, uh, an electrical system. I've got quite a few of these. I think I'll, I'll wrap it up shortly here. This 
This is in Baltimore. Look at the sense of age on this one as well. This one feeling old, feeling scorched, especially here. There's a scorching going on. Discoloration. New York City. There's that stonework and you have the, of course, it has to be some sort of basement going on here. So that mud flood narrative creeps in as it often does with these old buildings. I know I don't have great resolution for a lot of them. A lot of these, this is the only uh, vi visible copy I could find. Some of these so that no longer stand. If you want to know where one of these is in particular, um, you can uh, throw a comment down below. Let me know the timestamp and I will find it for you. It just is too cumbersome for me to um, attach a name to all of these. There you have the basement windows. So basement windows are always an indication that we had an excavation go on here. Um, so that's a deep excavation, right? So that's a lot of work. A lot of work for that time period. This interesting one too, Tower, Tulsa. Remember the, the windows again? This one in Harlem, uh, this is a really interesting area, the boroughs of New York. Um, I remember seeing an, an old video, a John Levi video, I think, um, of the, the enormous amount of rubble that existed um, in that area, in the Bronx and Brooklyn, I think, uh, in the 70s, 80s. A lot of photographs of just rubble everywhere. Like how much demolition went on in these areas. Um, there are a lot of photos um, from these areas, armories, churches, um, endless it seems to be actually, of th these types of buildings and I suspect many of them no longer stand. So there was, there was so much more than we uh, understand I think and realize. There you have the basement windows again. All right, I think we'll wrap it up there. Uh, I just wanted to bring you some more visuals, old world visuals, and present to you some of the ideas that uh, are, I think are worth exploring. Thanks for joining me.